file a, an eviction uh, during that 120 day period and you can't then notify, you have to get, you can't file an eviction until you've given a 30 day notice and the 30 day notice cannot be sent until the expiration of the moratorium period, which is so effectively the way I see it, you're not gonna be able to actually uh, file an eviction action if it's covered under the CARE Act until about the end of August. So let me ask you, do you know of anything in regards to those homeowners, if they have a person in the property for those say three, four months that are not paying rent, is there any relief for the homeowner then in regards to paying their mortgage? Cause some of, you know, some, some homeowners are counting on that rent to pay their mortgage. Absolutely. Yes, there is. There's some, uh, there's some provisions in the CARE Act that sort of correspond to these, this moratorium on evictions and that will permit, um, the mortgage holder to request uh, forbearance from their lender. Forbearance is not a forgiveness of the debt, but it could be a, uh, a restructuring of the debt or a temporary uh, uh, abatement on, on, on payment. You, you ultimately have to pay it back, but the lender's gonna have to work with you uh, on restructuring your uh, mortgage and I, I gather that that could be up to a period of a year uh, from the, I guess, from the effective date of the legislation, which was March 27th. Uh, and there's also a shorter um, moratorium on mortgage foreclosures, which I think runs through May sometime. So um, a lender wouldn't be able to foreclose on you uh, if you were unable to pay your uh, mortgage payments uh, on account of a, you know, COVID-19 related issue. And so um, if you're not getting paid rent um, and you can't evict somebody uh, under the CARES Act, then you can turn around and seek forbearance from your, from your lender. So there is some relief there. Okay, the, thank you. The next question is, um, if a tenant's residing in a non-covered property on a month-to-month -month lease, can the landlord terminate the current lease, providing sufficient notice, and offer a lease extension with a rental rate increase? Um, yeah, if it's not covered under the CARES Act, then you're, you know, you're operating under the state law. And the state law just won't allow you to evict somebody because the courthouse is closed basically. But, and, and you can, um, you can charge late fees, fines and penalties, uh, which you can't do under the CARES Act. I should have mentioned that. Uh, you can't, if they're uh, not paying their rent under the CARES Act, you can't, uh, charge them late fees, I think. Um, but if it's not covered under the CARES Act, yes, you can charge late fees, fines, and penalties due to late payment, <clears throat> but you're not gonna be able to evict them if they don't pay it um, because the courthouse doors are closed. So, you know, even if you can file the eviction, you're not gonna be able to get the case heard until probably the beginning of June. Okay. That's what I think the next question pretty much asks the same thing is that um, does the tenant remain in the property the whole 120 days, even if the lease is set to expire? Um, I assume the tenant can choose to cancel their lease within the time limits of page one of 410T, but the owner management company will not be able to provide termination of the lease for the next 120 days if it's covered. So we're kind of talking about we're at a stalemate for these 120 days if the tenant's still living there and they don't want to leave. Yeah, and I don't know if it's a distinction with a difference, but if it's um, if it's not covered under the CARES Act, you could terminate the lease. You just if they didn't leave, you can't evict them. You know, <laughs> so they would become a holdover tenant, I guess. And so I don't know. Uh, every case is going to be a little bit different, and some, you know, the strategy may be well, no, let's just keep the lease in force. We don't want to terminate the lease, uh, or you could terminate the lease, and they would be considered a holdover. But either way, you're going to be barred from having the case heard until probably the beginning of June. All right. So we have another question here from Wendy. This one's a little bit 
I guess, more involved. So they have a tenant who was informed, they informed the property management company, company that they were having difficulty paying rent due to the pandemic. And also one of the tenants was hospitalized with a confirmed case. They live in a single family home. Their lease was already up at the end of April and they were moving out. They have not paid April rent and now are asking for an extension through May 31st. Prior to the pandemic, the owners did not want to renew the lease due to HOA complaints about the tenants. What do we do? The owners have a government backed mortgage on the house. Also, what can we tell the owners without written express express written consent can they disclose the tenant has the virus and the whole family is quarantined and what would express written consent consent look like for health condition okay well that's several questions uh, all wrapped into one there but um i think it's the same basic answer this this looks like it is a um, federally backed mortgage loan situation and they're not paying their rent and so I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to evict them until uh, 30 days after the end of that moratorium on July 25th. Okay, so it's kind of we're back to that same thing. <laughs> that yeah, and 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 it's complicated, and 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 I would, I would urge people not to uh, you know read more into what I'm saying about their particular situation because these. These are pretty fact specific, and I might have a little bit different answer uh, depending on what your facts are. And uh, that's that's a good reason to call the legal hotline if you have a question. You know, we don't give specific legal advice on the hotline, but happy to sort of uh, help talk you through a situation. And uh, you know, we're handling uh, more hotline questions than ever. We're doing them by email right now because the uh, state association's offices are closed. But if you've got a complicated question, you can just email us and we'll call you back. Um, uh, give Will, can you, can you give us that phone again. number for the hotline and the, the email? The email is uh, uh, legalhotline at ncrealtors.org, legalhotline at ncrealtors.org. Just send us a quick email. If you've got a simple question, we can try to answer it by email, or if it's not, give us your phone number and we'll call you back. Okay. Um, uh, as far as the other part of uh, Wendy's question, uh, I've had a couple of questions about um, property managers have become aware that a tenant has uh, got the uh, has, has been diagnosed as uh, having the having COVID nineteen. Uh, her question is Wendy's question is what can we tell the owners? Without express consent, can I disclose the tenant had coronavirus and her whole family is now quarantined? I think the answer to that question is yes. I mean, HIPAA laws don't really cover residential landlords. They don't, you know, the protections under HIPAA uh, don't really extend to residential landlords. Um, so I, I don't think there's any, and I can't think of any other you know, you don't have a fiduciary relationship with the tenant. I don't think it's confidential information. Um, you know, should you tell your owner? Uh, I don't know. Uh, probably you should uh, tell the owner. I had an interesting um, question that I, I uh, went to the real estate commission on that I'd like to share with you. And it was, a property manager was managing a, uh, or is managing a multi-unit complex of some type. And uh, they became aware that one of the tenants uh, had the coronavirus. And they wanted to know if they were obligated to disclose that to the other 32 tenants in the complex. And, um, I sought input from the real estate commission on that. The real estate commissions, two of their attorneys said, no, uh, it's not, they wouldn't consider that a material fact, or they said they wouldn't discipline an agent who disclosed or didn't disclose. Um, and they said, you know, we should all be assuming that everybody we come in contact with has the virus, mm -hmm. you know, and, and act accordingly. So, 
they didn't consider that to be a material fact. You know, should you disclose in that kind of a situation, um, you know, from a risk management point of view, you know, maybe it's a good idea to disclose to the other tenant because, you know, even if there's possibly no legal liability, ultimately that can, that could be a public relations nightmare if somebody really got sick or God forbid died, you know, and uh, nobody was aware. Yeah. And you were aware, of course, you know, it's going to be very difficult to establish causation, you know, uh, that they even got it from the, the tenant because uh, you can get it anywhere, you know. So it's going to be a difficult legal case for somebody, but just from a public relations standpoint, uh, you know, it would look really bad. So, you know, you might want to go ahead and disclose, perhaps without disclosing the identity of the affected person, you know, in a multi, uh, you know, multi-unit complex. Uh, there's really no necessarily any reason to disclose who is involved, and although you may not have any legal obligation not to disclose the identity of the tenant, you know, um, you know, I, I don't see any reason why you would uh, disclose their identity. I agree. Um, the next one kind of transitions over, and I don't have the attachment, but I don't know if you got it in the email, but um, it, it's an agent that they have not had any progress for applying for the benefits. Um, of the unemployment assistance. Is there any advice that you can provide in how they can accomplish getting this unemployment assistance? Well, that, that's a complicated topic. And I sent Zan some information uh, just a little earlier today that I had gotten from uh, Katie Thomas uh, in uh, the NC Realtors Raleigh office. Katie's been staying on top of this. And um, from what Katie tells me, um, and I'll just read from a portion of her email that she sent me. The latest information we have is that North Carolina is still working to get the system up and running for independent contractors. They are going to participate in the federal PUA, that's um, pandemic unemployment assistance, but likely will not start accepting applications until April 25th. However, the benefits are retroactive. So I guess the good news is, is you're going to, be entitled to participate in the federal program, even though under North Carolina law, independent contractors are typically not entitled to unemployment benefits. And I guess because they're not, that's uh, it's taken the, uh, uh, the state a while to uh, get the system up and running so that you will be able to apply for the federal benefits. And it's according to Katie, it's looking like April 25th right now. And if this is too far off topic, please stop me. But um, in regard to that, for an entrepreneur or a real estate agent, you know, independent contractor, whatever you want to call us, unemployment benefits, would they have to completely stop working in order to collect those unemployment benefits? Because if you're still making calls and doing deals, does that qualify for unemployment? Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question, but I have seen something that said that if you're able to work from home, then you're not possibly you're not unemployed, you know. Um, so right. it's a good we'll question. On. We'll move on so I don't make that more complicated. All right. So um, we talked about this a little bit earlier this morning, but I figure we could touch on it now with everybody. Um, doing a virtual open house, how are we protected if the buyer does not physically see the home and places an offer and is accepted and they find out something makes them want to terminate? And we talked about that a little bit earlier. In our market, we do have a lot of sight on scene complete to purchase sight unseen writing the offer and then see the home prior to actual purchase. So if you want to talk a little bit about what you were mentioning this morning with that other form. Yeah, we, um, you know, we rolled out a form a couple of weeks ago, uh, the uh, COVID-19 addendum. <clears throat> we had a lot of questions about that. And then we got a, a, a lot of um, requests in the last, I don't know, 10 days for um, a form that would allow parties to put a property under contract, uh, allow the buyer to put the property under contract sight unseen uh, because they're uh, operating in an area where there are, is a very restrictive stay at home order that, that really prohibits showings, which I, don't, which I gather is not the case in 
Cumberland County because you're operating under the governor's orders, I understand it. But some places it's much more restrictive. And so we approved on Friday and it's being released today. And I've sent a copy of it to Zan just a few minutes ago, uh, something we're calling a um, on-site preview addendum. And it's designed uh, in situations where uh, a buyer's ability to actually preview a property, physically preview a property is prohibited or restricted by uh, a local state or national uh, quote unquote stay at home order. Uh, and the idea is that you'll be able to put the property under contract for an agreed upon period of time, presumably a very short period of time, uh, for an agreed upon fee, presumably a fairly nominal fee, and then uh, it'll be an attachment to the offer to purchase. So you're under contract, but it's subject to the buyer's ability to actually physically preview the property, conduct a visual inspection of the property, and then decide if they're going to proceed with the transaction. And if they don't wanna proceed with the transaction, then they'll have to notify the seller prior to the end of the, the agreed upon period of time that they're terminating. And, uh, and if they terminate, you know, the contract's over, nobody has any rights or responsibilities to the other. If they don't terminate, then the contract proceeds just as it would have, uh, you know, under regular circumstances. So that form will be available uh, to you, um, possibly to use. I, it may not be any demand for it in a place like Cumberland County if uh, showings are not really restricted, but, um, you know, if you've got, it's not really designed for, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's not designed for a broad application for anybody like a military person who just wants to put a property under contract before they can get here and see it. It's not really designed for that. It, it might work for that, but that's not, that wasn't the purpose that the form was designed for. And um, I think it'll probably be a temporary form uh, that, uh, you know, once the, uh, these restrictions are lifted, that, um, the form will probably be discontinued, but. Now, in regards to that form, you said if there's a negotiated fee, if they decide not to go through with the contract, is it similar to due diligence that the seller would keep that fee? Yes. Yes. It's, it's, it's basically non-refundable. And the, what the buyer is purchasing is the right to actually, um, decide, you know, after they conduct a preview, whether or not this is really the property that they want, you know, did it, does it really look like uh, it looked in the virtual tour that I took or the pictures that I saw? So and just out of curiosity, how does that kind of clearly define differently than just having a due diligence period in general? Well, is it's it much more different? limited. It's, it's oh. limited to a visual inspection. Okay. Uh, the buyer doesn't have the opportunity to conduct full due diligence. Uh, during this very limited period of time. Okay, and if they close, is the money credited back to them or no, it was like a, a fee yes, paid? Yes, it will be applied. It's, it's like due diligence money in that way. It'll be applied to the purchase price if they consummate the transaction. Okay, um, and then another question that we kind of have been coming across is that- Wait a minute, oh, before sorry. you go there, um, Will, did you say that a fax uh, question and answer fact sheet was coming out on this today or tomorrow so that uh, yeah I've, I've written a q and a that's coming out today i just i just sent it off to the nc realtor staff to uh, finalize and it'll it'll be in the uh realtor rundown that comes out every monday um just like the regular weekly q and a's that we put out that's this week's q and a just sort of summarizes how the form is supposed to work. And before we get off uh, on a different topic, I didn't <clears throat> really answer the question about virtual open houses and how you're protected if the buyer doesn't physically see the home, then they place an offer on it and then they find out uh, something that makes them want to terminate. I, you know, we used to, years ago, we had something in the offer to purchase that uh, where the buyer said um, they confirmed, I think, that they had physically seen the property or worse to that effect. 
and that's been out of the contract a long time now, and it was so long ago, I can't remember what our thinking was uh, in taking it out. I think maybe because in certain cases, people were actually not seeing the property before they closed and uh, or the very end or before they made the offer. And so it just didn't align with the facts, I guess. And so we, we decided to take it out, but you know, people ought to be discouraged from putting properties under contract, you know, before they see it. <laughs> um, and uh, we don't really have a form that strongly encourages people to look at a property if at all possible before they put it under contract or if they do you know don't don't be paying a big due diligence fee uh because you're not going to get it back um but they ought to be they ought to be pretty strongly advised uh in that regard if but at the end of the day i i'm, I'm not it's a big practical problem. I don't know if I see it as a legal problem. If somebody, uh, you know, puts a property under contract without looking at it, I think it's on them really at the end of the day, uh, not you uh, as a broker. But, you know, having said that, it does put, it, it, it does pose some, uh, you know, some, some practical problems for you and it, and it ought to be discouraged. Does the buyer's agent, do you advise that the buyer's agent tells the seller's agent that this is a sight on scene contract or does that then kind of go against your duty to the buyer, I guess, per se, well, if we're not an agency? So let me understand that. So, so when you make an offer, I guess the listing agent doesn't necessarily know whether or not the buyer making the offer has actually seen the property. Correct. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't, I'm not sure that I consider that to be, would there be any reason why a buyer would want to keep that confidential? Well, I was thinking like, I was just, as we were talking about it, I was thinking that maybe if it was a multiple offer situation, it would be a negative because, mm -hmm. you know, obviously you haven't seen the house or when we're negotiating due diligence money, it could become a factor because as a seller, I'd want more because I'm risking taking it off and you haven't seen it. And a buyer would probably want to do less because they haven't seen it. So. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know if it's a material fact that you would have to disclose, but um, I, I guess I can see situations where a buyer may not want you to disclose it. And so I guess it ought to be a discussion that the buyer agent would have with the buyer. Uh, about whether or not they want to disclose because as you say that might actually if the seller says well why aren't you offering more mm -hmm. and the buyer can say well it's because I hadn't seen the property yet you know I haven't had the opportunity to so right. yeah interesting okay. question okay so um, another one that has come up is with the sellers and buyers under contract and the seller is a military member and he has been placed on hold so it's May 11th right now, but let's just say that changes. And the military member can no longer sell per se because they don't know if their orders are still gonna be in effect. Buyer still wants to buy. If the seller does not end up selling, is the seller then in breach? Well, you say the seller can no longer sell. Explain that to me. I mean, as in they no longer have orders to move. So they no longer wanna sell their home because they don't, want to move down the street, they're no longer moving to Texas. So they're just saying, we're going to take it off the market and cancel the contract. <clears throat> and the reason they no longer have orders to move is directly related to the pandemic. I would say, yeah, like maybe it got changed because right now it's on hold. And then some people's, um, some sellers are now getting canceled altogether because they're now within like two years of retirement. So they're not going to move them anymore. So it got canceled. So in that situation, is the seller considered in breach for not finishing the contract? Yeah, that, that could be a complicated answer, but um, I would say just as a general proposition, I would assume uh, that the seller would be in breach in that situation. Uh, there are a couple of doctrines applicable in North Carolina that will relieve a party of a contractual obligation 
if as a result of some unforeseen circumstance, and I think a pandemic would certainly uh, would certainly qualify, <clears throat> if as a result of this unforeseen circumstance, their performance becomes impossible, or um, the uh, purpose of the contract is frustrated somehow, the frustration of purpose doctrine. They're fairly extraordinary remedies, and um, they might be applicable in a particular situation like this. You've got, you certainly got one of the ingredients, the unforeseen event, but uh, you're not gonna be able to prove impossibility. I mean, literally, it's not impossible for the seller to complete the transaction. It's just, right. it would be really unduly burdensome for them to do so. And so, would that be enough to legally excuse them from the obligation to perform? That's definitely something they'd wanna talk with a lawyer about. Possibly, but I would assume um, that the, because they're pretty extraordinary, it's a pretty extraordinary remedy and not often granted that for planning purposes. And um, I would probably assume that the seller would be in breach in that situation. And when a seller is in breach of contract, what are their obligations to pay back to the buyer? Well, that's going to depend on the contract that they sign, but if they use the standard offer to purchasing contract, the, uh, the, the buyer really has a, an election there, and um, the buyer can declare the seller in breach and recover uh, all damages that they're legally entitled to, and those would typically be damages related directly to the breach, uh, due diligence fee, due diligence costs, could possibly include other costs, um, or, you know, the buyer has got the possibility of uh, suing the seller for specific performance and requiring the seller to actually perform the contract. Uh, that, that's a fairly extraordinary remedy, too, uh, but it is, it is alive and well in North Carolina. Um, so, of course, you got a practical problem right now. You couldn't file the suit, you know, or... Yeah. Uh, or yeah. maybe you could maybe you could file it. Actually, I, I'm not a litigator. I, you might be able to file it, uh, but you certainly couldn't. Uh, well, at least not without consent, because now uh, Chief Justice Beasley's order is going to permit some types of remote uh, hearings with the consent of the parties. But you're going to have a hard time, you know, um, suing a seller for specific performance right now. Would be more difficult. And it's difficult. It's a difficult proposition anyway. So it's not, it's not a remedy that's often pursued. So typically the buyer would be asking for damages. Okay. Um, Zan, do we have, that's our list of questions. Are there any other questions from the audience out there? No, I don't have any questions, but some comments, the um, NCAR form apparently was emailed out to everybody this morning from NCAR. But I do have a question, um, and those of you who are listening, um, if you have questions for Will Martin, this is your chance to get them answered. So go to the chat box at the bottom of your screen, click on it, and then type in your message. After you've typed your message in the little box, remember to hit enter, and we will see it. Um, and while y'all are doing that, Will, I've, I've just got a situation um, to run by you. We are in a VA loan market, and there is a document that typically the VA buyer signs at closings that state they will occupy the property within 60 days of reporting. And that's designed to keep a VA buyer from purchasing a home on their VA eligibility and using it as an investment property. Um, if we had a loan in process that closed and now the VA buyer cannot move, they may miss this 60 day window. And the second part of this question is the same thing applies to homeowners insurance. A typical homeowners policy says you got to occupy the property. And I know two doors down from me in my neighborhood, this, they had a closing several weeks ago. The buyer has moved, but the, uh, I mean, sorry, the seller has moved but the buyer can't move back into the property because they're stuck in Georgia or Europe or wherever they're coming from. Any advice on um, how to handle insurance and or 
the loan documents that say we must occupy within a certain amount of time. Wow, those are those are two pretty tough questions, Dan. Um, I don't know a whole lot about insurance. I would it. I guess um, you know. Would they be able to get a uh, a more limited kind of a policy that a landlord would typically get? Would that would that be available? I guess um, you could have. Um, I would think if you just called your your homeowner's insurance agent and and told them of the issue and they notified the insurance company, they may waive that that clause. Or I hadn't thought about it, but you could come back and just do a a, a policy for the structure, not a homeowner's policy, because your your goods and stuff aren't inside the property. Right. Yeah, I don't know what type of uh, relief might be available from uh, through the insurance company. Uh, and I'm not sure I know, um, you know, that VA loan, if you don't occupy within 60 days under these kind of circumstances, I just got to believe there's going to be some kind of uh, uh, forbearance there uh, that the um, the VA lender wouldn't be able to foreclose uh, on account of the fact that they were in, in breach of their, you know, the uh, deed of trust that requires them to occupy the property. But that's a great question, Zan. I'm, I, I don't have a real quick answer for you on that one. Sorry. All right. Um, I don't have any questions from the, uh, uh, from our, audience if you do please put it in the chat box you got your shot at will martin hey you might as well get it There's this is like four of you somebody has to have a question and, and this is like can we stump will this morning you know this, that'll be easy you've already done it a couple of times <laughs> now, this is hollywood squares can we stump will all right uh, i got a question for you tenant occupied property is under contract for sale if the tenant, all right, so a tenant occupied property is under contract for sale. If the tenant decides not to move out by the time of closing, what rights does the new buyer have? Do they take them on as a tenant temporarily and evict or mutually terminate the contract? Um, huh. Well, um, it's a fairly common question we get on the hotline about um, you know, if property sold subject to a, a residential tenancy, you know, what happens? And basically nothing happens. The, uh, the tenant, um, the, the lease continues in full force and effect. It's not affected by the transfer of ownership. So the tenant, you know, in, in this situation, the uh, tenant's going to, I don't know if they had the right, if they were going to, did you say they were scheduled to move out? Was that the understanding of the parties or is it not clear? It's not, or not clear. The yeah. Yeah. The tenant just chose not to move out by the time of closing. So um, now if the if contract you, between the buyer and the seller, um, if the understanding was that the tenant was going to leave um, and then the tenant doesn't leave, that might, might conceivably can be considered a breach by the uh -huh. seller. You know, they're not providing the property, um, you know, uh, uh, so that the, the, the buyer can, you know, live there. Um, and that might be considered a breach. Yeah. So you'd work that out. Uh, another question, will this be recorded? Yes, it's being recorded as we speak. It's available on our association website, on our YouTube channel, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if they can stream it back to your Facebook account, but um, it is absolutely being recorded. And uh, I assume you'll cut out the parts that I didn't know the answers to. So. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, absolutely. We will make right. sure yeah. that- Make me look uh, good. Make you look good. Yeah. All right. So I got another question for you. Now we got them started. Tidewater question. I'm never sure what tidewater means. Does that mean upside down in your mortgage? I, I'm not, I don't know either. Water is when the VA appraiser calls that there's not value on the home. So you have an opportunity to provide your comps. Oh, okay. So once a buyer's agent is notified of 
tied water by the lender. So it's a VA loan that the appraiser's gone out, has not gotten value, and before they're telling you the value, they're calling Tidewater to you, so you can provide anything you can to the appraiser before he makes his final decision. All right. So once a buyer's agent is notified that the appraisal didn't meet sales price, is the buyer's agent required to notify the listing agent? And if so, what's the timeline? And I would does say I'm sorry. And then does the listing agent have a chance to provide their CMA or comps? So. Well, um, agents are required to disclose the material facts and uh, material facts, uh, according to the Real Estate Commission's definition, include facts about the property, facts affecting the property, or facts affecting the ability of your principal to complete the transaction. And so if what, I guess what you're hearing from the VA lender is I'm not going to be able to uh, appraise this for the purchase price, that's going to affect the buyer's ability to complete the transaction. And so that probably would be a considered a material fact that the buyer agent would have to disclose to the listing agent. And honestly, a lot of times the lender does copy the listing agent and the buyer's agent and says, we have Tidewater, please provide any documentation that could help support your pricing. Okay. So, if that helps. So the, that buyer's agent would have to inform the listing agent. And then how does it work, Megan? Do the listing agent can contact the appraiser and say, here's comp? No, so typically you have a three day or 48 hour kind of turnaround and you have to put it on the, the um, graph grid um, adjustments and all of that. And then you turn it back in directly to the lender and the lender will submit it to the appraiser. All right. And they don't want the full blown CMA, just for any agents out there listening. They want the graph with the adjustments. So they don't need the 19 pages of how you got your value. They just want the grid format. All right. All right, here comes a fun one. If a substitute trustee D, <laughs> whew, we're gonna have to have legal def definitions here. If a substitute trustee deed was filed March 18, 2020. You wanna tell me what a substitute trustee deed is? Yeah, that's the, um, the substitute trustee is almost always a lawyer who the bank um, appoints to uh, handle the foreclosure. And so right. at, the end, at the end of a foreclosure process, the substitute trustee will, uh, will convey title to the foreclosed property by a substitute trustee deed. All right. So that was filed on 3-18-2020. How long, considering courthouse closures, could it be before the lender proceeds with a foreclosure? It's a VA loan, the couple's divorced, husband's in another state, notice went to somewhere in North Carolina, nobody's gotten any notice, and um, the ex-wife wants to stay there till she absolutely must move away. <laughs> that was a good, you deserve the question of the day, Diane. <laughs> Well, I'm a little confused by the question because the, the, the substitute trustee doesn't uh, sign and deliver the deed until the end of the foreclosure process. Um, that's the very, that's like the last thing that happens. And so is this a situation where the, um, the people that were foreclosed on wanna know how long how long before you can get them out or is it on the front end of the process and the foreclosure is just being filed? Uh, well, it says substitute trustee deed filed. We'll need a little bit more uh, yeah. um, information. So too complex, Diana, give us some more detail. We'll try it again. All right, uh, Laurie How Linder, why would you use the new firm, new form coming out today instead of a regular uh, DD fee and DD period in 2T form? Well, you could, but uh, as I think uh, Megan and I discussed a little earlier, the, um, 
the um, the buyer's rights when they pay what we call this on-site preview fee are much more limited. They're limited to uh, uh, a physical preview of the property, a visual inspection, just to decide if they're going to go ahead and proceed with the contract. Um, I think one of the reasons one of the, one of the reasons it was explained to me that uh, there was demand for this form was that buyers were not wanting to pay a big due diligence fee uh, on a property they hadn't seen yet. Uh, so you know, which is non-refundable, they wanted to see it before they paid like the real due diligence fee. Um, so I guess that would. That was one of the reasons why we created it so that the parties could agree on a lesser fee, presumably, uh, that the buyer would pay for this very limited right to see the property. There are blanks in the form. I mean, the period of time that they've got to preview the property are negotiable and the amount of the fee is negotiable. Um, presumably, you know, you could negotiate a zero, I guess. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's the difference from a. So does the house come off the market until this visual inspection takes place? Is it technically sold? It's it's or under con it's legally it's under contract. Um, I know one of the brokers uh, I just talked with about it from the Charlotte Marketplace said that it's she anticipates that it's going to be a you know twenty four or forty eight hour period because that kind of gets you inside the period of time that you've got to report the uh, sale or the, uh, the contract and change the status in MLS. So, um, you know, the buyer can preview it in 24 hours. If they decide to terminate, you know, you've never had to uh, change the status in MLS. You know, if they decide to proceed, then, you know, you change the status in MLS like you normally would. Uh, but if you had a longer period of time than you had to report a change in status to the MLS, I guess you'd have to report the change in status. It's under contract. Right. Subject, yeah, to the buyer, subject to the buyer's right to terminate for that agreed upon period of time. Right. So, um, uh, and, and those of you who are listening, that form, I think was emailed to everybody in the state this morning. Apparently some of our folks were receiving it by email. We've got it up on the Longleaf Pine uh, Association website. And um, you said, uh, Will, you said a fact sheet uh, question and answer on this form will come out later today. Yep. Excellent. All right, any other questions from, from our live studio audience? If you're too shy to ask a question uh, in this uh, format, feel free to email us on the legal hotline. And that is legalhotline at <coughs> ncrealtors.org. That's right. And we put it in the chat box. Got one more. Um, property management is an area, Phil needs a little more guidance. How to proceed when filing evictions on tenants. If they not pay in April, May rents, whom lose a job, routine inspections. All right, so we discussed the evictions uh, early on in this session. And let me re review that for me, Will. You're saying that evictions can't even begin again until the courthouses are closed for evictions until most June? likely, Most likely the end of May. End of May. <laughs> So you could begin filing evictions possibly in June. If it's not covered by the CARES Act. If it's the CARES Act, if there's a federally backed mortgage on the property, um, there's a, I'm, I'm just looking for. And federally backed mortgages are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VA, FHA, right. Farmer's Home, most mortgages are federally backed or, 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 or in some way, shape or form, you know, right. I guess not all of them, but most of them are a uh, seller or a landlord ought to be able to figure out relatively easily. I think whether confirm whether or not it's a federally backed mortgage, but um, 
it's 120 days through July 25th, I think. And then you have to give a 30 day notice no earlier than July 25th of your intent to uh, terminate the lease. Right. And uh, during that 120 day period, uh, you can't file uh, an eviction action to recover possession for non-payment of rent uh, or other fees or charges. And you may not charge fees, penalty, or other charges to the tenant related to such non-payment of rent. And you may not issue a notice to vacate until after the expiration of the period. That's the 30 day period. Um, and that's July 25th. I think it's the and 25th. Our discussion early in this session. And again, this session is recorded and will be on our YouTube channel. So you can watch it again, but the remedy for the homeowner is to go to their mortgage company and ask for forbearance, which is, basically let me skip three or four payments my understanding is interest doesn't accrue i'm not real clear mm -hmm. on that i'm not so sure about the interest if you're relieved of the interest payments i, I expect you're not because you're not yeah. you're not relieved of the underlying obligation to pay the mortgage back it's just that they've got to cut you some slack uh for a period of time if you qualify okay. it's, you know you, you can demonstrate hardship sure all right. Diane, I hope that answered that question. Um, any others before we go? All righty. Well, Will, Megan, it's been an honor to be with you here this morning. I have learned a lot. I got a couple of pages of notes, a um, couple of follow-up things. Legal hotline at ncrealtors.org would be if they want to email you a question direct. Um, we uh, have that service through the North Carolina uh, Realtors Association. And um, uh, any of these documents that we've been talking about, plus everything that we've been able to gather, the governor's, um, the governor's orders, local uh, curfew in Fayetteville, all of those documents that we've been able to find um, in reference to government action, the CARES Act, all of this is on our website at Longleaf Pine Realtors. And uh, we have it in a big Dropbox file. You can go there and read it all. So uh, those of you who are listening, thank you for tuning in. Megan, Will, you got anything to tell them before we go? No, appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys this morning. Well, it's our honor to have you, Will, as always. I hope to see you somewhere soon. It's always a pleasure. Megan, awesome job. Thanks, Thank Megan. Thank you for being here. Take care. Bye-bye.